All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of On the Bench. Joining me today, none other than Scotty Hill of Skid Row. What's going on, dude? How's it going? Yeah, great to see you, man. It's been a while. I know. I know. It has been a while. I, I think we caught up before all this craziness began a little bit. I came out and had some coffee with you guys. Yeah, I think you were like one of the last folks who, you know, we got to really chill with. So, you know, it, it that was great. But, man, you know, normally we're, we're always trying to keep in touch, at least, you know, every, every month or so, like we get together, you yeah. know, you come, in, come in for a setup or, you know, a, a setup's a good excuse to, to come by for lunch, get, yeah. get a little sushi, you know. Grab some lunch, play a bunch of guitars. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, how, how have you been? Uh, what, what you want to, man? What's that? Uh, how have you been? What like what's been going on at home? I've been good, man. I've been good. Well, you know, we got we got a nine year old set up uh, on the dining room table doing the homeschooling. So anybody, yeah. who, a parent doing that knows knows how much fun that is. So yeah, that's that's, that's gonna be tough. And you know, it's like all 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 of a sudden, all the musicians have all this time off. Yeah. I haven't sat not for this long in decades. So for real, yeah. it's been it took it took a while to get to, but now I'm settled in and Good. when I go back I'll, I'll of course be super stoked, but it, that's gonna be a, another adjustment period. Yeah, yeah. I mean you're gonna get you know, you'll feel refreshed when you finally hit the road. You'll you'll have lots of energy, but then you know, you gotta get used to that whole, you know, life on the road again. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be a, a a tough one for everybody, but I think um, if anybody's ready for it, it's gonna be you, man. Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, I, I love traveling. I, you know, aside from playing and performing, I, I really love to travel. You know, and, and uh, I didn't used to love, it, but I do now. And yeah, I miss it. But it is really great to be able to spend time with my family, and you know, get to things. Yeah. You normally can't get to because you know uh skid row we do fly dates which means if we're playing in america we'll we will leave home you know we'll head to the airport super early on friday morning uh mm -hmm. 3 a.m and then we'll Ooh. go uh, fly somewhere do a show that night head back to the airport you know it's not really going to bed it's like 2 a.m lobby call after a show wow airport go do another show and then head to the airport again, two, 3 a.m. And then home for dinner, exhaust. Uh, yeah, um, man. You know what, that doesn't leave you enough time during the week, you know, it takes a day or two to recover. And then, you know, you get, you get your, it's like you split your life in half. You got this domestic life and then you got this road life that's, you know, the rock and roll life. Yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I I mean, it, it's got to take a toll on you, right? Just physically, you know, staying up 24 hours or, or whatever. And, and, you know, back in the day, it might have been going, you know, running on the all the energy of, you know, going to all the great cities, playing these huge shows and, and staying up, hanging out, partying with all your, your, your friends and other, you know, acts that are playing with you. I mean, you guys are. Play well, with everybody. Or not to mention that uh, you know, in those days we did bus tours. And, yeah. You know, and I have a saying: when you when you travel when you tour on a bus, the gigs come to you. Because you know, after the show, you get on the bus, you close the door. Next time you get off the bus, you're at the next gig. Yeah. You go to bed, you sleep, you watch TV, you do whatever. Uh, so this is different. You yeah. Know, yeah. That you get to uh, you get to a gig or a hotel after traveling for twelve hours, and then maybe take a nap, go to sound check, eat something, do the gig, come back to your room, try and stay awake, and then head out. Now I'm not this. I'm not complaining. There's no sob story here. And it's <laughs> be able to do that, but it, it it it'll it'll beat your ass. Oh yeah. Oh, I, you know, I, I have the utmost respect for 
guys on the road, man, because that's I learned at an early age that, you know, the road is, is hard. Like, I, I don't think I could ever do it just because, you know, I need my I need my sleep. I got to I got to be well rested in the morning. And, and uh, like, are you one of those guys that could sleep on the airplane? I can sleep anywhere. I mean, <laughs> at this point. Oh, yeah, I get up like I mean, I'm asleep before they even shut the door, really. Oh, wow. I, I sit, I, I get in my seat, I have a routine, you know, I, I put the earplugs in, I pull a hood over my head, and I'm out. Oh, wow. I See, that's like so impressive to me because I just could not do that. As soon as like, the, you know, I get a little light in my seat, you know, from, from the plane doing one of these little whoops, you know, I, I'm immediately, you know, freaking out. I'm like, oh no, oh no. <laughs> Actually, that used to make me nervous, um, but now it's like it's kind of soothing to me. It, oh wow! It just kind of rocks me to sleep if the if the plane starts shaking around and, and all that. Yeah, but you know, you know I, we fly so much, so yeah, much, and we've had all kinds of experiences in the air. So you know, air stuff and uh, yeah. And that, that see, that's the thing is you get a, a little desensitized, right? You know, so. Yeah. Um, a, a couple of times I was taking trips to uh, like go to Japan. I know you went to J you go to Japan a lot. Your wife's Japanese, right? Um, and you know that's another kind of uh, synergistic thing there, where you, you you know working with us. Um, but you know I would fly to Japan or went to Indonesia, and man, it was like you know crazy long flights. Um, in in previous work, I flew to China quite a few times. And yeah, it's just like you would sit next to somebody that like this was every week they were flying to to Asia from you know from New York, so like they got to go a long way around and just don't yeah, they don't they're even. They're, they're really they're you know these business travelers. They'll a lot of them will travel like you say every week. They'll travel over there, and those yeah. flights those flights are tough. You know, like like you said, I go to Japan a lot. Um, yeah, and that's. I, I, I love doing it. I love going to Japan. It's, it's really yeah. Great. Of course. Matter of fact, I should be over there right now, but I, I can't. Okay. Yeah, I know it's a bummer. I, I wish I can go back too. I mean, there there was plans I think for us to go this year. Um, you know, COVID messed up a lot of things. We were supposed to do Summer Nan, um, go do a little demo there. Um, they just started. Uh, they show a couple of uh, our guitars in uh, in the Ginza shop in tokyo so um that was really exciting i was hoping that i could you know sometime go over there and check them out and uh yeah it's you know it, it's tough but you know sooner or later we'll get back and, and the good thing is that japan you know they really got this thing nailed down they you know the the mask wearing it is part of the culture anyways you know it's a courtesy if you don't feel so great you, you pop it on know from traveling there people who haven't traveled there it's very common for japanese people to wear masks in public uh, you know maybe a quarter of the people you see walking around on an average day are wearing masks yeah um, for one reason or another uh and and you know they're also they're not they're not very uh physical you know they're they, like we see each other we hug and we're yeah like, we're hot, I mean, they're putting our hands all over each other <laughs> A lot of hugging going on, not a lot of handshaking, more bowing. Yeah. But then on the flip side, you know, during rush hour on those trains, you know, you see on TV the the the, the pushers. That yeah. Push the people. In Stuffing you in there. So the door can close. And that's a real thing. Yeah. A thing I've experienced. That's just incredible. They just push them in. And then the doors close and it's silent. Yeah, yeah. It, well, on trumpets, there's nobody with a boom box. There's you know, <laughs> nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, not so. You don't. You know, no kid the, the box of candy. You know, raising money for the school or anything like yeah, that. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's a courtesy thing, and I think that's one of the things that I, I really appreciate about the you know Japanese culture is like it's very considerate, yeah. and um, you know, it, it's nice. It's a, it's a good thing you know um it people consider themselves part of the community it's not you know uh the america me first kind right. of thing you know it's, it's us together and uh i think that's 
it's great. I, every experience I've had there has been wonderful. And, um, you know, that goes for working with my Japanese coworkers as well. It's been, you know, really wonderful working together. And, uh, you know, luckily we also get to work with awesome artists like yourself, um, working on, on your guitar. So, I mean, that's, that's the thing that's been so much fun working with you is like you, you have kind of an understanding, um, through the Japanese culture and we've worked together it's pretty fun and um, this, this is the first guitar I ever made you this is the first one yeah first and one. Um, yeah I mean to talk about it you know we uh, we tried something a little different than what you normally have I mean um, we went uh, the uh, well first of all we went with the ebony fingerboard yeah. Uh, because back in the uh, back in the early days of Skid Row, I played an ebony fingerboard, and I, yeah. was, I wanted I wanted to revisit that. I love how it feels. I like how the the uh, the moisture it absorbs it, it uh, uh, absorbs the moisture from my finger. I got really sweaty hands. It's nasty. I go through strings like crazy. But sure. it's uh, it's a gorgeous piece of ebony you got there, and. Um, we also went with the flame maple top, and that's just you just picked a beautiful piece of beautiful piece of maple there. And yeah, that was a fun one. To complement that beautiful, uh, that beautiful mahogany back. Yeah, and then uh, yeah. So typically, you know, we were playing um, just mahogany bodies with. Um, you know, maple necks. That was kind of like your tone. Um, but this one, we tried something a little different. We made it more like a like a current Pacifica. We just put your pickups, a Floyd Rose, in there. Um, and the unique thing about this guitar was, you know, it's all French polish. So that that finish is about a hundred or so coats that I hand applied, and then you know, you stand in between and, and do the whole deal. I spent hours working on this finish, so so I could scratch it all up. But it's uh, it's no, it looks really up pretty good. Gorgeous. It's just got such a nice sheen to it. It's really, really just a gorgeous, gorgeous finish. And uh, I wish it didn't have so many scratches on it. It's it's in much better shape than the other guitar. But no, you know, this is I I really like when it gets chewed up. I mean, um, when you know, the guitar gets chewed up a little bit. It tells me that you're playing it, you know, and it, it tells me I did a good job. So that's what I'm excited about. Um, so, I, you know, I, sometimes it makes something pretty, but I, I want it to look cool. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we really did that with the the second guitar. Um, but yeah, this that, that one was, was a lot of fun. It was, I think we uh, got a little noise. I, uh, this is my this is my go-to Floyd guitar at at home here in my studio. This is that's usually sitting right next to my desk, and when I when I play something with a Floyd, I use that stuff with singles and and a lot of acoustic and and all that. But when I go to the Floyd guitar, the first one you built me, I call it I call it the uh, I call it the deluxe because it's got a tone control, and I yeah. I'm, Control guy, so it's got the deluxe feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As opposed to the, the second one, the second one's only got the volume control and the switch, which was a lot of fun. I, I, I like the way that that came out too. Oh yeah, this is now. This is uh, this is a classic. This is very typical of what I've played for many, many years. Maple neck um, and uh, mahogany. Very simple. Yeah. Uh, most of my guitars start out with a, a, a Seymour Duncan JB right there in the bridge. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure which one this is, but uh, we put a single right there in the neck. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the Floyd, which is yeah. We've got the, we've got these outfitted with FU tone uh, brass blocks, solid brass block. Yeah, titanium inserts because, like I mentioned, my hands corrode. So those little inserts are titanium. 
Yeah. Not as corrosive. And I block my Floyd, so you can't pull them back. Yeah, yeah. So my Floyds will not pull back. Uh, you yeah, know, that little stopper in there, that that little Effutone stopper is, is yeah. really cool. Um, and it, 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 yep. And also what I did was uh, I put the uh, F, Effutone PMS. Oh, actually, you put it in there. Um, yeah, it's like that little brass bar. The brass and, bar that the pickup screws into. Yeah. Uh, and and you can see on the back through the, the tremolo cavity, there's a little hole. A little hole in there. And that's pressed. It, there's a little screw in there, a little stainless steel screw that pushes up against the back of the pickup. Yep. So the pickup and the body are really coupled. Yep. And um, yeah, it's, it's a nice fit. And it's just. Uh, you know, I, I think modern guitars, like one of the weak points of the modern guitars are like the uh, the the plastic pickup rings. Um, mm -hmm. It just seems to me there's got to be better, something better out there. So th so that's why I went with this and it it, it works well for me uh, and it, it's, it stays in place. It's very solid. Um, it's fairly easy to adjust the pickup height. And uh, and I, I think it's a good product. Adds a little weight to the guitar, but that's all right. You know. Well, the guitar is not very heavy overall. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a nice piece of mahogany. This one, it's uh, as you can see, it's it's got it's got a little uh, a little wear and tear on it there. Well, it's it's just clear satin nitrocellular flacker on top of it, and. Um, I think every time I'm talking, I'm getting a little bit of noise on on uh, on one of our end. I'm not sure what's going on there. You're crackling. Ah, uh, yeah. Turn off that big muff. <laughs> yeah. I like I, I love oh it. yeah, and that headstock took a nice little lick too. Yeah, this headstock, as you can see, it's got a little it's got a little flat spot on the end where the airline did a number on this, and uh, they must have uh -huh. dropped the headstock first. And when I when I got the case back, the uh, the that little uh, I don't know that tongue and groove rim around the case, it was dented out. What? Dented out like that. Oh. And, uh, it it hit so hard that it shifted the neck. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's so it had a millimeter that way, and this pickup. Is crooked because it broke this little piece of wood and shifted it back. But the neck is so solid in the position. I probably had to re-intonate it because everything moved. It's about a millimeter gap there. Yikes. Yeah. And then it's got that little crack. I don't know. Can you see that? Yeah, a little, little bit. But actually, the guitar held up pretty well, and um, you know the the tone uh, is still there, thankfully. It's a, tank. Um, it's a tank. It's ready to go. It's ready to go. You can see they're wearing out a little bit, but I I have to because uh, I, I don't I, I don't wear my glasses when I play, so I, I usually before the show I'll take a sharpie and I'll hit the hit the dots with the sharpie. Yeah. See where I'm going. Because I like That's to use awesome. the force. I like to use the force and just, but it doesn't always work. Because I'm not, <laughs> yet, you know, not yet. Well, that was one of the things, you know, where you were saying um, on stage, you know, you want to be able to see the dots, you know, kind of distance and dark and stuff. So we put the glow dots in there, um, and we got to make them even bigger next time we we make. If you're playing under real lights which are very rare nowadays. Everybody uses LEDs. That's why all the stages are so dark. You know, like yeah. LED lighting is the worst thing to happen to rock and roll since chairs, man. Um, the, these are great, but if you're under real lights and all the lights come up, then you get a reflection off of the neck. Yeah. You know, but when lights go down, they look really cool. I like to show them off. Well, it looks super cool. And, you know, the, the cool part about this guitar is, you know, because this guitar finish it more, um, you know, relatively quickly. And the other nice part is that every time you have a show, 
um, you know, you do a little something to it. Um, you know, you put a little notch in there for each show. So all around the edge of the car. Yeah. That's the most rad thing ever. Got my notches. So oh. when I do a show, I'll take my knife and cut some notches in there. That's so, so cool. So each one of those is a travel day and a hotel and a gig and some sweat and some noise and yeah. Yeah. I started doing that uh, uh, a few guitars ago. And, uh, yeah. Before I got together with you guys, I was using a guitar that looks similar to this one, and it's got the it's got the notches all the way around. All the way around. That's so rad. This one, they come down. Yeah. About, yeah, that's so they come to about there. Um, I'm not sure. It's probably a couple hundred on there. I think I don't know. I don't know if we counted, but I can't. I, I don't know how many. A few. That's so sweet. So what, what's your rig been these days? Uh, I'm using a camper. I've been using, oh, okay. I've been using a camper for a couple of years now. Um, it uh, Because we have been doing fly dates for a long time, and a lot of bands that do fly dates, you show up to all the gears there. You bring your guitar, you plug into some rental Marshall, and you go. And I'm great with it. Marshall JCM 900 and a tube screamer. That's like my rig, you know, but the rental gear is usually taking a beating and uh, therefore it's not consistent. You know, you'll show up one day and the amp is great. You show up another day, different amp, different conditions. So, yeah. I, consistency. so uh, I use the camper to about 1% of its capacity because it's just, a, I found a Marshall in there I liked, and then I set it up with what they would have as a tube screamer, put a noise gate on it, and it's good to go. That's that's the rig. Um, and it's consistent if it's in a small box. And I have also used the THR 100s, which are also really cool. They fit in yeah. the, the same thing. I was used, I used those for about two years, and uh, and they're, they're wired into the home studio now. Uh, and those are those are along the same lines. It's it's I need consistency, so I can't carry around an eighty pound, hundred watt tube amp. It's just not it's just not practical. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I, I carry my stuff through the airport. You know, I travel with two guitars and and a Pelican case and a small suitcase. So anything I can't carry doesn't come along. So I'm not carrying a a, a big heavy head. You know. Um, yeah. So what were you using um, back, you know, in the early days, during like, you know, play to the grind and, and you know, the early kid row? I beg your pardon. What What were you using, you know, during, like the first Kid Row album and play to the grind? Uh, first First Kid Row album was uh, there was a lot of the ADA preamp on there um, that I used. Uh, Snake and I both used. We've always had very similar rigs, you know. Um, the uh, the I believe it's the MP one ADA yeah so it was the, the ADA preamp you know the one with the blue uh, buttons on it and those were I used a, that a lot on the first record I used it on the first tour and then after that uh, before we started recording Slave to the Grind I started using Rivera uh, I don't remember the model but it was the the hundred watt head with bunch of knobs and push pulls and stuff like that, which like, I'm not really into the, the, the lots of knobs thing and lots of push. I, I, less options, the better. That's, that's my whole thing. Don't give me a bunch of options. Cause I, I I'll sit around and fool around with it. I'd rather be playing, you know, just volume gain tone, boom, you know? Uh, so, uh, but the, but the Rivera, I got a sound. I liked it. And that's that's what we use. So you know, when I got to play clean, I just kind of back off a little bit over here. And so, uh, but those tours, those were Rivera heads. I had a wireless unit. I think we were running some sort of um, some sort of reverb uh, and delay. But 
I don't use a lot of effects live. I let the front of house guy do all that out front. Yeah, that's what I always love. You know, your your setup was simple, but man, it was heavy. And you know, going back listening to like Monkey Business and everything, it's just, it was such a great tone. I always loved it. it. Was you know, it's iconic, really. And you know, some of your really cool guitars throughout the history. It, it was an honor, you know, when when um, Scott Marceau, came, you know, our artist relations guy came up to me and he goes. Um, you think you're up for making a guitar for Sky Hill? And I was like, yeah, man, of course. This is awesome. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, there's always that thing where you say, don't meet your heroes. But guys, I got to tell you, this is the hero you want to meet. He's like the nicest guy on earth. And, um, you know, you guys played with everyone. You played with, you know, Aerosmith. I, I, I'm doing a whole Bon Jovi tie up, right? With, with Snake. Um, being friends with John, you know, early on, and he helped you guys, uh, you know, early on in, in the career, you guys opened up for him. Um, what was it Castle Donington? Uh, yeah, we uh, we played Castle Donington uh, before it was called Download. We played it twice. We played it. Uh, we played it with Metallica, and we played it with Iron Maiden um, back in the back in the nineties, and then. Yeah. We played uh, Download, uh, you know, two years ago, and then we were supposed to play, I think we were, I don't remember, no, yeah, two years ago, and then four years ago, I think, but I'm not sure, because it's just a blur. Yeah. It goes and like I mean, you guys also do, like, that huge festival in Russia, too. I mean, what was, like, what was the biggest show? What was, like, the craziest, like, most exciting for you? Well, the, the, the show in Russia... 1989. Uh, for those who don't know, look up uh, Moscow Music Peace Festival. Moscow Music Peace Festival. It was a, it was a giant show that was put on by our manager at the time, Doc McGee. Uh, it was during the Cold War, right at the end of the Cold War, and it was Bon Jovi, us, Cinderella, Ozzy, Scorpions, Motley. And all those bands, forgive me if I'm forgetting anybody, but uh, we all got on the same airplane and flew over to Russia, you know, enemy territory. <laughs> five days over there. We did two massive shows at the uh, Leningrad Stadium, which was, uh, which was the Olympic Stadium. And it was just, you know, like, it wasn't more, much more than a year before that. You know, we were all working day jobs. Snake and I were working at a music store. And so, and then here we are on this plane with Ozzy and Motley and Scorps. It was quite amazing. It was really, really cool. And, we, you know, over the years, we've done some big shows. Yeah. You know, we, uh, we did, like, a, a show in, in uh, South America called, uh, in Brazil called Hollywood Rock. And I still get a lot of correspondence from fans that were at that show um and that was i think that was us in extreme it was like sixty thousand brazilians going out of their minds and dude and you go you go down to south america and those crowds get crazy man yeah and everybody says that like the crowds in, in south america are just like so grateful because not everybody is down there you know, um, comes in force in South America. So it's just like always been a crazy, awesome atmosphere. And, you know, people like, you know, all your songs, they're locking out. It, you know, every every band that I've heard goes down there just like has such a blast and it leaves such a lasting impression. And, I mean, that's got to feel amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, really, really, really cool. Uh, you know, in, in the early days of Skid Row, we toured a lot really you know our the first time we left for tour we were out for uh 22 months and then we came home and we did slave to the grind and we went out for uh no uh, no we're uh 16 months was our first tour our okay, second so it was crazy 22 months it was the second one and then you know you trial by fire really i mean Learn, you learn the road really quick. And like you had mentioned before, you don't, I don't know if I could handle it. You know, once you're out there for a month or two, you get into a routine and 
you're all good, man. Just cruise along. Yeah. Try not to kill yourself. It's, you know, it's, you're young, you're living a crazy lifestyle and, uh, feel invincible so you know it, it can it can be it can be dangerous too yeah well I mean, let's talk about that a little bit I mean, you know you have to have trials and tribulations right starting that young um what was it like was it were you scared you know what was it tough being you know out on the road playing these huge shows I mean, you guys went from you know just straight to five times platinum, right? Yeah, I mean, our rise was quick. It, it, we came up really quick, and um, we were so busy touring that it was it was uh, it was kind of hard to see it happening. So I think we might have lost you. Could be. Nope. Me. I, I'm here. I'm looking. I'm just grabbing okay. some phones. So yeah, we were we were just playing so much, you know. One day leads to the next, to the next, to the next. It's just all like one continuous day. The success happens around you, and it's kind of hard to see it while it's happening until you stop and take a take a breath. So you come home on break for five days, and you know people are freaking out. Your friends are like, ah. Oh. You know, you go to the mall and people are walking up to you and stuff. So it's really, really weird, man. You know, it's, it's it's one thing to go out and play in front of a bunch of people and they're freaking out. But then you come home and you go to your local grocery store that you always shopped at and that people are walking up to you and they know your name. And, and it's very strange, very strange. And I can't imagine for people like who are really big stars, you know, the Michael Jordans, and you know. You know what I'm talking about. Big, big stars. Bon Jovi and things like that. These guys, these guys, they couldn't get them. Here we go. I'm going to mute everything. There we go. Oh, yeah. I got to change it up a little bit. We're having a little audio problem. Sorry, folks. So I'm joining from my phone instead. But, yeah, I mean, you just jump right into the into the mix you know you're, you're playing massive massive gigs yeah I and mean, I, I remember at one point there was a stretch of, of shows this was our early 2000s and we were, we were really touring a lot and kind of working our way back up and uh i remember going out on stage one night and thinking didn't i just do this like a few hours ago I mean, not like yesterday, but didn't I just get done doing this? And then the next night, I mean, didn't I just get done doing this? It's, it felt like every night I was going out there and it felt like I had just gotten off stage, taken a break, and then going back out because it was just, we were just rolling, man, rolling. So many shows in a row and, uh, and moving so quickly that a lot of, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of times you don't realize what's going on around you. You know, the whole, the whole machine is growing, it's getting bigger, it's getting more popular, but it's hard to see because you just, you just yeah. keep breathing and playing. Yeah, so, I mean, when you, you know, are out there and, you know, it, it feels like, you know, I was just here, how are you dealing with the stress on the road? Are you like, are you exercising? Are you, you know, meditating? I, I think you did a lot of that, you know, in like we've had some talks later in life where you're just saying like, Oh, you know, I I've really changed like the way I do things and stuff, you know, like what advice do you have for, you know, the people that are about to go back on the road? I mean, this isn't going to stay forever. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, in the early days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me stress nowadays. Yeah. I do meditate. I do yoga. I, I exercise a bit. Um, and I take, I take pretty good care of myself. I don't drink. I don't do anything else. But it, it used to be the exact opposite. I used to do everything else and nothing good for myself. So uh, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of alcohol and a lot of other stuff and uh, not a lot of sleep. And, and uh, my son's peeking his head in. He's like, what are you talking about? Stuff that he doesn't know about yet. Uh, but it 
was not uh, is not a healthy healthy lifestyle, but it's what we were doing. And you know, even at that time, it was, it was very accepted. Uh, so uh, I'm lucky enough to have made it through that. And I don't know if I would change anything, but you know, I, I got I got friends that that didn't make it. You know, I mean, a lot, I know some guys and people that you know and uh who didn't didn't make it through that that period you know it's like when you're um, yeah like i said before you feel invincible and and you're excited you're on the road but also uh what people don't realize is it gets boring out there and you hear about you know you, you do the show you get that high and you, you know the energy of the crowd and then it's done and you walk into a a, a cold locker room in some building and you're just sitting there until the bus rolls and then you know the next gig comes to you and then you walk into the next one and it's just a matter of boredom after a while and you know those bus rides are long and you're stuck on there with a bunch of guys and back in those days everybody smoked so you got 14 guys on a bus smoke chain smoking cigarettes yeah <laughs> Wow. As a Marlboro advertisement, right? And, uh, you know, even then, there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, like the internet existed, but not like now. So it's like there's not Netflix, there's not, you know, things to keep you occupied. Well, when there's, we started, there, was no, there was no internet, you know, yeah. no internet, uh, there was no cell phones. You had a calling card, and you had to find a pay phone. And then dial in a long string of numbers that you eventually memorized. It was just a whole production to make a phone call. And there was no internet, no Netflix, no iPhone, no nothing, man. Books and uh, CDs. So we used to carry around these big boxes filled with CDs. We'd keep them in the jewel box, in the jewel box, in the box. And you'd have a box like, you know, this big carrying box, case logic carrying box have like 20 cds in it that was your collection and then you, you had your big cd walkman your headphones uh but there wasn't a lot to keep you occupied yeah what what was in the in the rotation there what was uh what was you know the, the normal j i mean i remember uh well you know it was interesting because when we went on that first tour we were out for a real long time our tastes in music changed. We were listening to, we started listening to real heavy music on the bus. And then that's how you get the sound of Slave to the Grind. Uh, so we left for our first tour, you know, and, and a lot of that music was written years before that, before we were signed. And then we left on that tour, our tastes in music changed, we became heavier and we came back and recorded Slave to the Grind. So that's, that's an interesting way of, how that happened and and you guys were playing with pantera too right yeah we uh that was one of the bands that we were listening to as, as a matter of fact i was home on a tour break and i was listening to uh local college radio that uh wsou in seton hall new jersey and they were the only place to hear heavy metal on the radio and i heard pantera i heard the song cowboys from hell and i was like this is amazing and I, I, I remember I was painting my kitchen and I dropped what I was doing and I went to the to the record store and bought the, the compact disc. It was still a new thing. And uh, and that record blew my mind. And I turned the other guys on to it. We're like, we got to go on the road with these guys. So they came out and they they uh, they opened the Slave to the Grind tour for us. That's sick. I mean, one of the early albums that I got when, as a teenager was that 101 Live. Yeah, my, my sister's boyfriend had left it at the house, and I just started playing guitar and stuff, and I, I was like really into Iron Maiden, and then he left that around, and I was just like, what is this? And then I popped it in, and like my mind was just like, oh, geez, this is like a whole other thing, you know, and it was, it was awesome. So, I, yeah, that's, that's really cool that, like, you know, started getting heavier for you guys and you can hear it in the sound you know it's 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 amazing yeah. well making making slave to the grind was was a great experience um because we had some success we had more freedom 
uh, not, as, not as much as record company breathing down our throat. Uh, it was February. We were in Fort Lauderdale. We brought our cars. We brought all our toys with us. And we were raising hell, man. <laughs> we, uh, we had these apartments. We, we rented these apartments in this complex. And we would just have these these massive parties and one morning we came out and all our tires were slashed so our neighbors were like uh not digging it yeah yeah you got the you got the the picture there yeah, yeah. that's wild so uh can you give us some of those tones from back in the day the tone yeah man play us a little something play us a little ditty can you hear it? yeah Yeah, you're playing it through the THR, huh? Of course. I did the uh, I did a tutorial for the I Remember You solo, and there's a Kemper sitting on the desk. Everybody's like, "Wow, what Kemper setting are you using?" I'm like, "Hey, your Kemper, man." <laughs> the THR 10. It ripped. Dude, Great. those are they're awesome. That So, I mean, who, who was influencing your playing early on? Well, I, I think the biggest influence on my playing was Jeff Beck, straight across the board. My, the biggest, total biggest influence. But um, a lot of my influence comes from guys like Neil Schoen, uh, Steve Lukather, guys who play kind of melodic. You know, Neil Schoen's like, his, his additions to those Journey songs are like songs within themselves. So I'd say that that was that was a big influence. Um, somebody I always loved and I listened to, and you would never hear in my playing, would be Al Demiola. I love Al Demiola, and I, I I was like, he's he's the reason why I got a Les Paul when I was a kid. It's like because I wanted to be like Al Demiola, but you wouldn't know it by listening to me play because that that technique is just it's not I can't do it. Um, but one of the things about Al Demiola is, and you never hear people talk about this, is his vibrato is just brilliant. Yeah, just really tight. I mean, if you listen to those old, like, Return to Forever albums and stuff, or, or I, I used to love listening to him with the, the, the trio. It was him, Paco De Lucia, and John McLaughlin, and I used to remember listening to that on the bus going to high school. Oh, in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, at the Mid Hudson Civic Center, and it was it was very thrilling. And I, I I wasn't, you know, Paco de Lucia wasn't really on my radar at that time, and I had never seen a guy do that piccato. What is it, piccato picking, or correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, tremolo picking, but also you know, like playing staccato. That that was a lot of the Al Demiola thing where he would pick every single note. And he's like, and if you don't pick every note, you're cheating, you know? Right. And Paco did it with his fingers, though. With his two fingers. Like a, like a hummingbird. And, and and you can just turn on YouTube now and see lots of people do that. But remember, there was no YouTube. We didn't even, did we have, like, when I was learning that, well, when I was watching that stuff, I don't think we had VCRs yet. So there was... You know, you didn't see that stuff. You heard it on records, but you, I didn't realize that that he was doing that with his with his two fingers. Just wow. And yeah, like, and and nowadays guys can do. You know, a, another thing we should talk about is what you're up to, which is you're doing that. You know, Masters of Shred Masterclass. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing. You know, and, Next and nowadays everybody is like so accessible, and, and especially you know guys like you who are so 
you know, graceful with your time and stuff, um, gracious with your time, excuse me, um, you know, it's awesome. They could learn directly from their influences, you know, how to play those tunes, how to, you know, how to think and write and, and play like their heroes. So, I mean, yeah, tell us more about that and like how people can get in touch with that. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's through Masters of Shred. And uh, you can you can find them on uh, Instagram, and uh, and there's probably a link in my uh, my Instagram as well. Uh, and I'm going to go over one of the one of one of my favorite solos that I do uh, by the song the song Forever by Skid Row that that was recorded for the first album but unreleased. And I and and eventually we released it on the, the 30th anniversary and uh, also a. Uh, best of skid row and i i always like that solo because it's not what would be typical for me it's more of a burner uh rather than something kind of melodic but also what i want to cover is what makes a good solo how do you create a good solo how do you create something that enhances the song and speak to people because you know it's you know playing something musical is more than just pressing putting pressure on the strings it's you gotta you gotta rub that shit man you really have to put a lot into it and it's it's more than just technique and vibrato and things like that it's uh it's thinking and thinking in a different way so i'm gonna i'm gonna cover some of those topics and and that that's so cool i mean i it's true i mean all those guys like you you mentioned jeff Beck. Al Demiola, you know, they, they had real feeling in their playing. And, you know, when I think of Al Demiola, I definitely think of high skill. I think of, you know, just incredible technique, but also, you know, the feeling. The, the music was melodic. The music, you know, really spoke to, it spoke to me, um, you know, and, and it was really inspirational. And I think it's important to not just play a solo to show off, but you're like, like you said, how am I adding to the song? How am I, you know, making an improvement to the experience, what people are listening to? And I think that's, you know, where Skid Row really knocked it out of the park, and, and, and your playing did that, too. It's about the song. Unless, you know, if you're doing instrumental music or if, you, or if you're doing, like, you know, heroic music or something like that, sure, man. But in our case, it's about enhancing the song. And... uh you know, you got to have your fun too. But to me, it's fun to uh, uh, create something that that takes it somewhere else. You know, the, the singer's not singing. Everybody's handing it over to you. Make the best use of it. You know, I mean, yeah, play a bunch of notes if that's what the song calls for. But if that's not what the song calls for, then that's not what you do. Yeah, totally. And uh, you know, it's it's like. You know, people people don't think of it. They think, you know, I'm a lead guitar player in a band. You know, it's my duty to show off. But that's not always it. You know, it's you're still part of a band. You're still like, you know, it's like working in a company. Everybody plays their part. Everybody has to do, you know, a portion of the song. Um, and, you know, the lead singer is responsible for, you know, singing the tune and, and reading the poetry, right? But everybody else is... is picking it up and, and being behind them. Um, and yeah, I, I, I definitely think it's important to realize that when you're writing. And um, so ha have you been writing new music? Has Skid Row been doing anything? Actually, the, uh, the, the pandemic has allowed me to come in here and uh, begin finishing a bunch of stuff that needs to be finished. Uh, Aside from writing with Skid Row, and we and we are, we do send ideas back and forth regularly, and we pop them in our machines. I'll throw down a guitar track, send it back to Snake, and he'll send it. You know, we do that, of course. But I'm also finishing up stuff that I haven't finished up because I'm like, I suppose, like any other artist, like get it halfway done and be like, ah, oh, this is this is any good? I don't know. Let's work on the next one. So. I've made a commitment to finish some things. What I'm going to do with them, I have no idea. But 
Yeah. So do you, do you have like a whole list of songs, like even from back in the day, like you still have some song ideas that are unfinished or anything like that that's come out of the woodwork? Well, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of, I mean, you, you know, before an idea becomes a song, it's, it's an idea in a, in a, in a folder with a bunch of other ideas, you know, and the, we used to have the dictaphones, you know, the little handheld tape recorders and we, you know, always have one of those nearby. But it's now mini cassette in there. Yeah, the mini cassette. Yep. And now, of course, we use our iPhones for all that stuff. And you know, they're just files and files and files because, you know, I'll be sitting around playing, and it'll be like, I'll I'll, I'll hear something interesting, and I'll be like, okay, that might be something. So I'll just, you know, I'll put it on the, uh, I'll put it on the iPhone, and when I need to go back and find it, I'll take that idea. And I'll dump it into my computer. I'll put it in the, I use Logic, um, Logic Pro. And I'll put it in Logic Pro and I'll just build on it from there. You know, so the idea will be in a separate track and then I'll clean it up and I'll play a cleaner track version of it. Then I'll lay down a, 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 a you know, a drum reference. And then just a matter of polishing from there. That's so cool. I, I mean, it's it's awesome how, you know, it's much easier to write and record and stuff and, and kind of suss out all those ideas. And when you do have an idea, you just pull out your phone and record your lick or whatever it is and then bring it back into Logic, do all that stuff. That's so cool. You want to automate your process, you know. So, so like, I don't, I don't... I don't listen to the idea on the phone and then start fresh with the logic. I'll just take that raw idea and put it right in there. And, you know, if, if you hear one of my finished tracks and you, if you look at the track, you know, if you look at all the tracks on the screen, you'll see up at the very top will be the, that original, you know, sitting out on the balcony, strumming something out and you can hear traffic in the background. It, it, it's not, it doesn't make the mix, but it's still there as the reference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you got to stay true to that original idea, right? You know, that inspiration. And I that's that's so sick. So uh, if people want to, you know, find out more about what you're up to or they want to stay in touch, where could they find more information? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a big uh, – I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I used to be on Twitter. I am uh, – I'm an Instagram guy. You know, I'm on Instagram. I don't have a website. I don't have any of that stuff. I just I – just, post pictures on Instagram, you know, I go for a walk and I post a picture and that's good. I'll get a guitar and I'll post a picture and you know, like we all do. Yeah. I think you're better off staying, staying off of Facebook and Twitter and stuff. It's been, yeah. it's been a crazy year so far. That's for sure. But, uh, it, 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 it's just toxic and poison. And it's just, yeah. yeah. Being on Facebook. But all I hear is people complaining about Facebook. So I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. No, thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank thank you for, like, bringing all, all the positivity and, and great music to the world. Um, and, folks, I, I hope you, you listen to more Skid Row. Uh, stay in touch with, um, you know, with Scotty. Um, and, you know, th thanks for supporting Yamaha. Uh, sorry about the sound issue today. Hey, what's up, little man? This is Marshall. Oh, very cool. Where did he got his name from? Gee, I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, you're, you really stack up. I got to say that. It's it's awesome. And your, your dad's the coolest dude ever. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank thanks for tuning in, everybody. And uh, people should follow your Instagram as well because uh, you're – I don't know if you've been posting that much lately, but it, what you do is – fascinating and i love coming over and, and seeing what's on your bench and, and watching you work with the cnc machine and, and all that stuff and of course seeing the beautiful pieces that are up there in the private show yeah thank you very much uh i appreciate it and well we got to do this again next time uh we'll we'll fix uh what's going on with the sound and, and maybe we'll do it in person at the at, in the showroom we can show off some of that cool stuff all right so uh, thank you so much for joining us on the bench, and uh, we'll, we'll catch up soon. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye.